I wonder how you thought about the story that we've just heard of. I wonder if you immediately, as soon as you began to hear Sharon read, you thought, aha, this is the story of fill in the blank. I wonder if for many of you, it was Doubting Thomas. Now I want us to think about that. If you stop and think about it, it's a very loaded title, isn't it? Which can have an entirely different meaning depending on the emphasis you put upon it. So to start us off, it can be factual. Thomas did doubt, as we heard in our reading. He doubted what the other disciples said. They said, whoa, we've seen this amazing thing. And he's like, I can't believe you. So doubting Thomas, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's what he did, he doubted. But it can also have another emphasis. It could be a cautionary tale. Thomas doubted, don't make the same mistake. Almost bad Thomas, doubting Thomas, that pointing finger. And I guess maybe that's how I sort of, I grew up thinking about this story. But here's a question for you. Can it be encouraging? Thomas doubted. I sometimes doubt. I'm guessing you probably doubt sometimes because it's part of being human, isn't it? If Jesus can live with Thomas doubting, then maybe he can live with us doubting too. Doubting Thomas. Three different ways in which that title can get us thinking. But I'd like to give it a different title. Instead of doubting Thomas, I want to give this a rebrand. How about the story of genuine, honest, authentic Thomas? Over the last 24 hours, our news has been full of tributes, hasn't it, to the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. One of the things he was known for was the odd, what the press used to call a gaffe. But I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last sort of 24 hours, lots of what I've been hearing is about how people really appreciated that in the crazy job that he had, that he was himself, that he was normal, that he was genuine, that he was authentic. I don't know about you, but if I imagine myself in his circumstance, if everything I said was being scrutinised and anything I said could be taken out of context, I tell you what, I'd have been in some headlines. <laughs> I'd have been in trouble. He had an impossible job where somehow he's supposed to be different, other, and yet we all want him to be himself as well. To return to Thomas, I guess his obituary in my eyes should read like this. Thomas was honest. Thomas was human. Thomas was normal. Thomas was just like us. So how about it? Thomas the genuine. Thomas the straight talker. Thomas the honest. Thomas the genuine authentic bloke. Let me make the case for defence. Let's put ourselves in Thomas's shoes. What's happened to him over the last few weeks prior to where our Bible reading picks up his story. Well, to put it mildly, Thomas has had one heck of a nightmare. Over the previous seven, 14 days, his world has been turned absolutely upside down. Everything that he's given his life to has been destroyed. His rabbi, his closest friend, has been brutally crucified. And he's put his life on hold to follow Jesus. And that seemingly has all gone up in smoke. And then to top it off, while all the other disciples are just cowering in a locked away room, 
he's got the bravery, he's got the courage to, to be out and about. He's out and about trying to figure out what on earth to do, what's gone on. And while he's out and about, the unbelievable happens. When he gets back and all the disciples are in his face. Can you imagine? Just so excited to tell him, Thomas, you went, whoa! And he's like, okay, get some space here. Calm down, come right. And the other disciples want him to believe in a crazy fairy tale ending that he's got no evidence for. And he can't do it, it's, it's too much. I wonder how you would have been in those situations. I wonder what you'd have been like. For him, it was just too much to simply accept on their say-so that Jesus was alive. Let's be honest, he knew that his disciple friends were as confused and traumatized as he was. He knew they were all over the place, sort of emotionally, spiritually, maybe even physically. Some of them hadn't been eating well and all that's going on and they want him to just suddenly just believe this crazy thing that he shares with them. I can empathise with Thomas. I wonder if it had been me, if it would have been, been too much to just open my broken heart to that hope simply because, you know, they're asking me to, to do so. They all get a tangible encounter with the risen Jesus. And he's got nothing. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, this is verse 25, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. It must have been really tough to say that to his best friends. When the, you, can you imagine, they'd just be so excitable, so overwhelmingly ecstatic. It must have been so brutally hard to say that to his mates. I wonder if he had that temptation to almost do the British thing of to put on a mask and to go, yeah, guys, that's great. While inwardly hiding his doubts. I wonder if that went through his mind, but he doesn't. It must have been so tough to say to them, I can't believe it, guys. I can't, I can't go there with you. You've just lost your rabbi. You've lost everything. And now you're presented with this opportunity where all you can do is either lie to yourself and to them or seemingly lose all your friends because you can't believe what they believe so passionately. But he said to them, unless I see the marks in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe authentic, honest, genuine, Thomas. So let's look at how Jesus responds to Thomas. We'll come to the disciples in a moment. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Be surprised by Jesus' reaction. Jesus doesn't criticise Thomas. He doesn't tear a strip off him. He doesn't say, Get out from this room now, you unbelieving disciple. I told you so many times, and now all my other disciples have told you, and you wouldn't believe. There's none of that, is there? He doesn't say, Thomas, you're fired. You've disappointed me. You've let me down. How could you? Jesus meets him in his doubt. Instead of a rebuke, he offers himself, he offers Thomas the very evidence, the very answers 
that Thomas has said he would need. There's no anger, no rejection, no guilt trip. He just simply offers himself to Tom. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear on the news or I'm in conversation with people, you know, sort of people criticising Jesus or criticising my faith, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm human, I find that uncomfortable. And sometimes, you know, I almost want to leap in and, and defend. But sometimes I also feel like I don't have the answers. I feel like I should, but I don't. And sometimes that leaves me either feeling guilty or sometimes angry. If I do have the answers and I want to, you know, sort of put them right or shout down the telly, no, 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 you know, Following Jesus is the best thing you can do. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned in my walk of faith so far is that actually Jesus is big enough to look out for himself. That's not to say that actually I don't really enjoy, you know, sort of engaging with people, talking about my faith, engaging with their questions, their doubts, their uncertainties. I love all that, but I don't have to win. I don't have to win the argument. Actually, I've learned, thank the Lord, I don't always have to have the answers either. It's amazing how many people think that somehow because you're the vicar, you're some kind of super spiritual guy or girl who's got all the answers to every big question. I'm, I'm sure you're already fully aware that's not the case. I take an encouragement from this story with that. Did you notice there was a little statement that just easily washes you by? But how long was Thomas with the other disciples before Jesus made his return visit? It was a whole week. How did that week pass? Was like Thomas sat in the corner, Billy no mates, feeling thoroughly uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. I doubt it, because let's remind ourselves who was in the room. Do you remember James and John, the Thunder of Thunder? Can you imagine them sitting in a room for a week with Thomas, just saying, just leave him alone, he won't believe us, it's fine. That wasn't going to happen, was it? Well, what about Peter? Peter's not exactly known for not jumping in there. They must have, certainly at the start, they must have tried to argue with Thomas, persuade him, but the fact that he's still there a week later, I think something else must have happened. I think that they must have loved him. They must have listened to him. They must have supported him. They must have offered him grace for him still to be with them a week later with this massive issue between them that they all know Jesus is alive and Thomas won't believe them. Seven days and then Jesus appears and he doesn't tear a strip off Thomas. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my sight. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus offers him his hands and his side where the soldier's spear pierced him as he hung upon the cross. Jesus meets Thomas where he is and offers him all that he needs. No dressing down for needing the proof. Just a simple offering of himself. And then he says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. At that moment, as he's talking to Thomas, Jesus is talking to us. He's speaking of you and I. Jesus doesn't physically appear to us. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But by his Holy Spirit, as we can all testify, he comes to us here and here. And note that Jesus speaks of those who have come to believe. Faith is an ongoing journey. It's an exploration with ups and downs 
ups and downs, with doubts and questions, with trials that make us question, with moments where we just feel, wow, I feel so spiritually alive. And then even maybe sometimes the next day, you're like, I'm really struggling. When challenges and hardships cause us to question God's goodness, to question what's he up to? What's the big man doing? Faith is a journey, not an instant download. It's a, it's a minute by minute decision to follow Jesus, not a once in a moment and then job done. So I wonder what questions, what doubts, what struggles you have. I wonder where you struggle for answers. I wonder if you felt guilty for having those questions, for having those thoughts, for having those wobbles, thinking I'm a Christian, I shouldn't be thinking this. I'm a follower of Jesus. How can I be struggling? All those lines of thought that can leave you feeling guilty or uncertain. The one thing I want you to know from our Bible reading today is that they don't exclude you from knowing Jesus. Jesus does not say, get out the room, Thomas. How could you, Thomas? And he doesn't to us. Thomas's experience reminds us that actually Jesus meets us with love in those questions, in those uncertainties, in those struggles. Let me just doubly underline this for you. Doubts and questions don't exclude you from the walk of faith. They're part of the walk of faith. When you felt guilty and rubbish and thought, oh, if only I were like so-and-so, they never doubt, they never question, they never struggle. I can tell you with pretty much certainty, oh, yes, they do. Jesus doesn't condemn you for your doubts. The amazing grace is that he meets us in them. He meets us in them. He doesn't tell us off. He doesn't tear a strip off us. Just as he did with Thomas, he comes to us and he meets us in them. You don't need to be guilty. 